Welcome to the Brown Carpet Podcast. My name's Corey Farrell. And I'm Josh Groom. And Josh, question for you. Hit me. What do we actually do on this podcast? Corey, each week we take a weird news story yes. and we twist it into a demented pitch for a movie. Sounds like the best idea for a podcast I've ever heard. Well, it's, it's not over. There's more. Oh my God. Once we're done with that, the listeners can jump on Facebook where they'll find a poll and they can vote for the one that they like the most. Is that all, though? Does anything else happen oh, after that? No, mate, there's heaps, heaps Oh, my more. God! Once that's gone down, <laughs> we pick a winner at the end of the week, and that winner gets turned into a movie poster. Oh, my... What more would you want in your life? What more could you possibly need? <laughs> that's great. Hey, we've also got a website. You can check us out at www.thebrowncarpetpod.com, where you can listen to the entire back catalogue of this nonsense. Not to mention the usual nonsense, Twitter. You can slide into our DMs on Instagram. And don't forget, you can email us at thebrowncarpetpod at gmail.com if you want to suggest a weird news story headline that you would like us to movify. Movify? Movify. Movify. It's a new word. And then we'll give you a shout-out and we send email you a poster, maybe, even if you... I don't know. Depends how. I don't want to. I don't want to promise anything. Yeah, no promises. No promises. Just do it. I have come here to chew bubble gum and kick ass. <laughs> Jumped over three linebackers in midair. Sprouted animals like a gazelle. <laughs> no one laughs at a master of quack fool. Real nice. Many have died from starvation due to the difficulty of finding enough food, such as seals. Shut up. No more Mr. Nice Duck. That's it. Right, Mr. Zitz? What do you make of that? You know, it's the most fantastic story I've ever heard. The Brown Carpet Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Brown Carpet Podcast. For the second week in a row, this is a Corey Free Zone. Instead of Corey Farrell, I am joined by a photographer, friend of the show, Mr. Peter Sharp. Pete, how are you, mate? Fantastic. Thank you, Josh. Thank you for having me. I uh, do. It's a real upgrade from Corey. Uh, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm quite concerned about Corey. Do you have an update on how he's going? Yeah, look, so the surgery took place last week, and uh, I know everyone's extremely concerned. I've only got bits and pieces of information as far as what went down. Operation went well. He survived. You know, that's obviously the first thing you want to hear. It's good news. Um, however, when the bandages came off... Red pubes. He Red? Was, he's yeah, a ranger. Not he's a ranger. It just seems like Antonio might have stiffed him on the whole pubic situation. It was meant to be Antonio's personal stash, and now he's got a ginger bush. Oh. So, Look, that's a bit of an issue, because I've got with me a hundred bucks to sponsor one of Corey's pubes. Well, would you oh. want to pay a hundred bucks for a ginger pube? No. No, of course no, not. No, no. Who would? No. Um, I reckon it's worth a quarter of that now. So at this point, Corey's over in LA. There are legal shenanigans going down. I'm, I believe there's a class action suit taking place against Mr. Banderas. But I'm going to have to leave it to Corey to explain exactly the ins and outs of the whole process. It's obviously very disappointing. It's probably quite traumatic for him. So, mate, I, I, I would just prefer not to dwell on this on this dark situation. Um, let's play it forward. You ready to do some paper, rock, scissors? I am. Here we go. On three? Yep. That's you to go, mate. Nice. Guests away. Hear that, Corey? I won. What did you find in your uh, news hunt this week? Look, I found I found quite an old article from the BBC, and it's uh, entitled "It's a Tale of Perfect Camaraderie and of Codependence." Okay, interesting. I'm intrigued. It reads: Two years at sea have fostered a close relationship between the two fellow sailors as they cross the globe through warm weather and cold. Okay. One is a 24-year-old male. The other is a hen. As in a chicken. As in a chicken. Not in, not as in a, a non-pronoun human being. No, as in a hen. Okay. Hopefully I've got this guy's name correct. Uh, I did I did look it up and I did make sure I was pronouncing it correctly. That's right. We put Gwai- your names every week. Guayek Sudi, the 24-year-old. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's not correct. Could you say that again for us? <laughs> I'll try. Guayek Sudi. Let's move on. Well, let's move let's on. call him Glenn. Yep. Okay, Glenn Moving it is. Yep. Glenn, the 24-year-old is the one who does most of the hard work on board the boat. Monique is the hen who spends most of her time admiring the view from the deck and laying the occasional egg. Okay. The two have started building up a close following online in recent months as French media have picked up on their unusual adventure. I knew she was the one straight away. Glenn tells the BBC from Western Greenland, where oh, he hang is on, now mate. moored. We're not going to go down like a weird chicken sex rat, are we? No, we're not. We're not. Okay. Uh, well, well, not in the news. Right. Can't guarantee that. Okay. We'll... All right, just once Look, it's in we'll, international let's, let's waters, get... I know weird shit we'll, goes down. We'll get to my movie pitch. It is a love story. Oh, God. Yeah. We're... All right, bring the bestiality. Yeah, Continue with the news story, though. What have we got? She was only about four or five months old then and had never left the Canary Islands. So underage to begin with. Not that Glenn is apprehensive about the prospect of their relationship being broken up. 
You don't have I'm a relationship, too... mate. You own a chicken. It's, it's weird. Well, I think it is a relationship, Josh. Right, it's, well, a, it's a very close one. That's the difference between you and me, Pete. Look, he says, I'm not too worried about that. I'm a positive person. There are positives to be taken too from having a hen instead of another person on board. Compared with people, she doesn't complain at all. And I think he raises a very good point. No, that is true. I'll give him that. So what do Glenn's family and friends make of his choice of seafaring companion? They found it very funny, he says. They've always known I'm not totally normal anyway. Well, yeah, no, we gathered that much. The next part of the trip will take the pair through the Arctic and down the Bering Strait towards Nome in Alaska. And from there? We're not quite sure yet, Glenn says. We haven't talked about it yet, but we will. We talk a lot, Monique and I. No, you don't. You talk to the chicken, mate. He's, he's putting a lot on this chicken. He thinks they're in a relationship. He thinks they're having conversations. I'm really worried about what's going on. I'm not concerned. Well, you're a strange guy. I know you'd love to see where I've taken this. I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing what you've done with uh, Glenn and his hen. Look, I'd just start, like to start with the top and say that while there may be some similarities in terms of the names that I've used and people we know, mm. I'd like to deny any connection purely coincidental Mm. very dubious okay Mm. what's the title of the uh, adaptation so the title is tiny and clucks excellent adventure okay right yep so the film opens with a fedex van traveling down the south coast of australia it screeches to a halt at the large gate to a farm with a big sign that reads sandra's sex clinic and egg farm all right i'm disturbed already a burly driver with the name tag billy bob to be played by sylvester stallone Mm -hmm. jumps out grunts throws open the back, grabs a large pink duffel bag, and throws it in the middle of the driveway. We hear a childlike squeal as it hits the ground. Billy Bob looks at the bag, lying in the puddle of mud and chicken shit, shakes his head, grunts again, and speeds off in a haze of dust. Meanwhile, the bag hasn't stopped moving. It's gyrating in the puddle. Sandra's sex clinic and egg farm is home to more than 500 chickens. The leader of all the chickens is Mother Clucker, and she has witnessed Billy Bob throw the object into the middle of the driveway, and so she comes flying down to investigate what's going on with this gyrating bag. The chicken's investigating? The chicken is investigating. So following Mother Clucker are her management team, Cluck Norris, Albert Eggstein, (laughs) and Attila the Hen. (laughs) Following close behind is Sandra herself, also eager to see what the commotion is. You see... Sandra is expecting a delivery from her local sex toy supplier, Gerald G-Man. Oh dear. But she has never seen his deliveries arrive in a pink duffel bag before. She's intrigued and excited, like only Sandra can be. With anticipation, she opens the bag and is shocked with what she finds inside. Inside is a six-and-a-half-year-old child with both hands down his pants. Okay, this, this is getting really fucked up, mate. Yep, I know. I told you, it's a love story. <laughs> Oh, God, here we go. Okay, continue, please. The gyrating has been caused by him furiously rubbing his penis, something he doesn't stop doing, even with Sandra, Mother, Cluck, Albert and Attila all looking down at him in disbelief. Okay. Also inside the bag is a change of clothes, an envelope full of money, eight tubs of Vaseline and some hand sanitizer. The child has a note gaffer taped to his head. It reads, Dear Sandra, this is my child, Corey and I can no longer care for him because he suffers from a serious case of chronic and aggressive masturbation. I can no longer afford the medical bills for his blisters, the constant treatment for the urethral trauma, as well as the never-ending supply of lube, moisturisers and hand sanitizer. I'm seeing a lot of real-life parallels here. I thought you might. Mm. We have tried everything to get him to stop, including electro-brain therapy, supergluing his hands to his head, handcuffing him to large objects, and even an exorcism by Cardinal Pell. Absolutely nothing has worked. Every time we tie him up, he manages to free his hands and immediately resumes the frenetic and aggressive massaging of little Corey. I can't bear the shame of being in public with him anymore, and as a devout Catholic, I cannot have the presence of his sin in my home. I read a story online about how you saved Tony Abbott from his addiction to gay porn. Please cure Corey and save him from going to hell. It's too late for that, mate. <laughs> the real Corey or this Corey? Which but, Corey? I'm both about. from the sounds of it. Yeah. It's very clear from looking at Corey that he's special. And so Sandra and Mother Clocker discuss what they should do with the rest of the management team. The consensus is that they take Corey in as part of the family. The timing is perfect because Mother Clocker and Albert Eggstein had just given birth to a very special handicapped little chicken. 
Did you say handicapped? I did say handicapped. I like that. Yeah, there's puns. It's good. I should have given you a pun warning, shouldn't I? No, no, pun away. The name given to him at birth is Josh. Oh, for fuck's sake. But everyone calls him Tiny. Sure. He's given the name for a few different reasons, but mainly because he is the smallest cock to ever be born at Sandra's sex clinic and egg farm. Okay, this is, this is the point where I'm feeling personally attacked. Told you, no okay. parallels. Pure coincidence. <laughs> okay, pure coincidence. Continue. Pure coincidence. Insert a montage of Tiny and Corey growing up together on the farm with the rest of Mother Clucker's crew, nicknamed the Peckerwoods. The Peckerwoods run the farm with an iron claw. Think a chicken version of Sons of Anarchy. Tiny and Corey both fit in well and immediately develop a close bond together and become best mates. They are inseparable. Tiny accepts Corey despite his condition and even gives him the nickname Cluck. Cluck carries Tiny with him everywhere he goes. The bond between Cluck and Tiny is so strong that Tiny has undergone a spontaneous sex change, which is something that roosters allegedly are capable of doing. That's and a so real now, thing. It's a real thing. So gender fluidity, not just a human thing. Allegedly. Okay. And now he lays, he, she, hmm. lays eggs to feed Cluck. We then cut to five years later. Cluck has grown up and he is doing his best to help run Sandra's sex clinic. But he still struggles with his affliction. He just can't go any more than 10 minutes without giving little Corey a vigorous rub. Mm. And the business, it's suffering because little Corey has become a trigger for Sandra's clients. The business has become so badly affected that Cluck's relationship with the Peckerwoods has also become strained. Cluck and Tiny have been talking about traveling the world together. And so they decide that it's best they leave the farm as soon as possible. They realize how much of a challenge this is going to be with Cluck's condition but come up with a brilliant idea that will allow them to travel while keeping Cluck away from other humans. Sandpaper gloves? I don't know that they tried that. Okay. Tiny suggests that they attempt to break the record for a chicken circumnavigating the world in a two-person canoe. The current record set by Amelia Egghart is 362 days, and Tiny is convinced that with Cluck's help, they can smash it. Firstly, Cluck secures a couple of sponsors, Palmolive and Kleenex, then after two weeks of intense training, off they go. There's a massive crowd cheering and waving as they paddle off from a small jetty somewhere along the south coast of Australia. Insert a montage of Cluck and Tiny's travels, swimming with whale sharks in Tonga, diving in the Maldives, enduring massive storms followed by calm seas, playing with penguins in the Antarctic, feeding salmon to polar bears in Canada, paddleboarding through the Greek islands, and surfing huge waves together in Hawaii. Sorry, did I mention this was a four-hour movie? This is a long film. No, that's, yeah, but no, that's yeah, sorry, probably good. should have. Yeah, it's a long film. Could be it's a trilogy. Film. The bond between them couldn't possibly be stronger. Tiny's laying at least six eggs a week, and they fall asleep each night with Cluck spooning Tiny. Yeah, no, I don't think he'd want to do that. Yeah, considering does. considering the fact he's They're masturbating close. every ten minutes, like I'd want it at least a good uh, two look, meters distance. I think the two of them accept each other for their flaws. Okay. We then cut to day three hundred and thirty-eight. Tiny and Clark are less than a week from home, sailing through the Pacific Ocean somewhere near Numea. It's two a.m. in the morning, and they are both awoken to the loud noise of a plane's engine exploding. Clark looks to the sky to see a large cargo plane with both engines on fire. Oh shit. It hurtles into the ocean, creating a massive wave, which crushes their canoe. Cluck and Tiny are thrown into the water. Cut to black. Fade in to Cluck and Tiny, unconscious on the beach of a small deserted island. They are surrounded by debris from the plane. Included in the debris are loads of packages and parcels which made up the cargo from the plane. Please don't let it be pawned. Please don't let it be pawned. No comment. Okay. Over the coming three months, they survive on coconuts. Oh, and sorry, a variety... how, how is coming spelt there? <laughs> Just yep. how you would normally spell sure, coming. Yeah. Yep, yeah. absolutely. Over the coming three months, they survive on coconuts and a variety of items they find in the cargo plane's packages. However, after four months, they begin to run low on food and water. Tiny has stopped laying eggs, and the result is that the relationship between Cluck and Tiny has become really tense. Mm. Every conversation is like walking on eggshells. Uh, I gotcha. Cluck is hungry, and Tiny is jealous of Cluck's new special friend. You see, in one of the many packages that washed ashore was a parcel, and as luck would have it, this parcel was a special order item from Gerald G-Man addressed to Tony Abbott. Somehow, it ended up on a plane to New Zealand. Inside is a limited edition, life-size, blow-up Arnold Schwarzenegger doll. Mm. 
Clark has become very attached to Arnie as he has found him to be quite the companion. Imagine. Now instead of just alternating between his left and right hands, he can bash one out with Arnie as well. Yeah. Another couple of weeks goes by and Clark and Tiny are no longer speaking. They are sleeping at separate ends of the beach. Both of them are starting to hallucinate. They have totally run out of all food and there is only a small amount of water left. So it's kind of like Castaway but with a sex toy. Kind of, yeah, yeah it is. Yep. Yeah. And a chicken. And a chicken. Yep. Clark can't even look at Tiny anymore because all he sees is a roast chicken dinner. Mm. Cut to black. The end credits roll. Oh, shit. Dark ending, man. But wait. Okay. At the end of the credits, yep. we fade into a half-naked Clark with a swollen stomach cuddling Arnie. So glad you said stomach then. Scattered around the fire are chicken feathers. Clark, with a big grin on his face, is cleaning food from between his teeth with the claw of a chicken's foot. Damn it. That's a real dark ending you've got there. It is. It was like Still a buddy a story. film. Like a, a, like a road film, but on the water. And then went down a real dark pathway. That it last did. 10 minutes really... Still a love story. Sure. A weird love... I mean, yeah. yeah. My kind of love story. That's uh, gruesome. Yeah. I'm surprised that a chronic masturbator never got round to humping the chicken. Not at, not at one point did he bone the chicken. You're assuming that didn't happen. Well, you never mentioned it. I look. I think. I think the bond between the two of them is probably best left off the screen. So you're saying there's it's open potentially, to interpretation. There's implications that they could potentially be. I think so. Getting nasty. I think so. In a canoe. I think so. Do you have a tagline? Oh, I do. What do you got? Who choked the chicken? Of course. <laughs> yep, no, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. All right, so talk us through your cast. Uh, look, my cast. So uh, the FedEx driver is Sylvester Stallone. Nice little cameo for the sly there. I think so. Yep. Uh, Mother Clocker is going to be voiced by Jackie Weaver. Nice. Josh Tiny yep. is voiced by Megan Mullally, uh, which is uh, Karen from Will and Grace. Oh, of course, right. Yep. Okay. Corey, a cock, yep. is, um, or the young Corey is going to be played by Gaten Mataraz. Uh, yes, yep. Yes. Stranger uh, Things. Yep, he's um, obviously a, a favourite of the show. Big fan. Of and then um, the older core is going to be played by Chris Lilly. Oh yeah, cool. Yeah. Yep. Chuck Great Norris. Person. Well, that's obvious. Going to be voiced by Chuck Norris. Sure. Albert Eggstein mm-hmm. is going to be voiced by Hugh Laurie. Nice. And Attila the Hen, voiced by Brian Cranston. That's a star-studded cast you've got right there. Well, I think so. What do you think you can do this for, cash-wise? Uh, 75 mil? 75 yeah, mil. Yeah, I want to get the team of Pixar on board. Well, Pixar, I think they punch out films for about 250 mil, so yeah. you might need to get some favours if you're getting them on board. What sort of rating are you considering for this thing? Considering this is basically a, a bestiality love story, man humps chicken on water, I mean, I'm thinking M is going to be like absolute baseline. Yeah, no, I'm thinking R. No matter how tastefully you do it. I'm thinking... Uh, oh, you're thinking hard R. Uh, okay, cool. All right, so we can get graphic. We're not, we're not holding back. No, let's, let's jump in. Now, my, my soundtrack. You haven't asked me about oh, my soundtrack. Oh, of course. My right. soundtrack's a cracker, and because it's a long movie, yep. I think it's it's an award-winning soundtrack. Okay. So are we ready? There's yeah, a no, few. Are you ready? Uh, absolutely okay. ready for it. Well, we've got, we've got Chicken by the Cramps. Yes. Here Comes the Chicken by the Wiggles. Okay. Right Hand Man by Joan Osborne. <laughs> yep. Chicken Farm by the Dead Kennedys. Yep. Muscle of Love, Alice Cooper. Yep. Eye of the Chicken by the Butthole Surfers. So essentially, songs to do with chickens and masturbation. Pretty much. <laughs> That's all we're Pretty gravitating much. towards. Yeah, I think we are. I got gotcha. you. I think we are. Oh, and thanks. my personal favourite, this yeah. is my personal favourite. Okay. Chicken of the Sea by the Go-Go's. Oh, that's perfect. Yeah. That's perfect. I can, I can see this being the blockbuster that dwarfs all others in 2019. Can I quit photography? Um, keep mm. the camera, just for the time being. Okay. But um, sure, let's pitch it around. See sure. who puts a hand up. Yeah, that'd be good. So, Josh, I'm dying to hear what you've come up with this week. I thought you would be, mate. Um, this week, my news story, not only was it featured on A Current Affair... Well, there's a reputable news channel. But the, the headline reads, Man uses mirrors to direct sunlight into neighbour's home in Dapto death ray dispute. Okay. I have to confess, I did not read this. Did you not hear about this? No, I didn't. It's I a think, fascinating story. I think all that's appeared in my news channels this week has been um, cricket. There's all been a lot of ball tampering issues. This should lighten the load. An almighty war between two sets of neighbours has stretched 150 million kilometres across the vacuum of space and back through a set of Venetian blinds after an Aussie couple accused their nemesis across the road of harnessing the sun's radiation in a bid to make their life hell. I'm sorry? Yeah. 
Kate and Stephen of Barber Street, Berkeley, a humble working class suburb near Dapto, south of Sydney, claim the man across the street has set up a blinding array of nine mirrors designed to redirect the blazing afternoon sun through their living room windows and into their eyes. It's like a Star Wars movie. It's a bleeding death ray, Kate exclusively tells The Current Affair. The police have basically said just keep your blinds closed and keep the kids out the back. In an extraordinary stoush that makes Darth Vader's battle against the Jedi's look like a petty schoolyard squabble, Kate and Steven also allege Nathan has set up cameras and floodlights trained into their property in a campaign of relentless neighbourly antagonism. Asked if he was a fan of the Star Wars film franchise, in which the Empire famously uses the intense beams of the Death Star superweapon, Nathan said, Yeah, The Last Jedi was shit, mate. According to Kate, the effects of the westerly appointed mirror array are so effective that at about 4.30pm she suffers from squinting and blindness and is unable to watch the television without closing her slats. It's a wonder our TV isn't burnt out. I'm at my wits end. Nathan claims his mirrors and... Can you just do that again? I just want to hear you do that accent again. I will not do it again. Nathan claims his mirrors and cameras have been deployed to protect his own property. Both sets of neighbours claim the opposing party has keyed their respective cars as part of the war, and Stephen said the words, cunt face, which recently appeared on his driver's side door... Sorry, you promised you weren't going to use that word. No, I promised I I would use that word. No, because I want my mum to be able to listen to this. I'm so sorry, but cunt is going to come up multiple times this episode. All right. Sorry, mum. My apologies to Mrs. Sharp. In a residential conflict that defies all sense and belief, Kate and Stephen have also erected a timber force field to repel the sunlight and floodlights from their front porch. Sorry, explain to me how they've created a timber force field. Basically, it looks just like a bunch of wooden pallets they've kind of stuck up in the backyard. And that makes it a force front field? Yard. I guess so. So the title of my pitch is The Rebellion of Funk. Okay. Right. The film opens with Ziggy and Fran Backer getting ready for their band rehearsal. Ziggy slicks his hair back with grease and slips on a pair of dark sunglasses. Fran applies hot pink lipstick and swings a glittery scarf around her neck. Together, they are the guitarist and singer of two-piece Christian funk band The Rebellion. Ziggy and Fran are to be played by Elijah Wood and Christian Schaal. You know Christian Schaal from uh, She Was In Flight of the Concords? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, good casting. With perfectly coiffed hair, tucked in shirts and freshly pressed slacks, they are immaculate, even for a rehearsal session. They flick on the garage lights, and it's decked out like the stage of a stadium show. The band's name in gaudy pink neon, custom made by Ziggy's Uncle Stavros. Fran plugs in her mic lead and flicks on the amp while Ziggy starts a smoke machine, lasers and disco ball spinning. On the inside of the garage door, there is a detailed mural of the view from the stage at Madison Square Garden during a sold-out concert. This way, even at practice, they're playing in front of thousands. They burst into their first song, Addicted to Jesus. It's a high-energy, incredibly cheesy, guitar odyssey, and Ziggy and Fran have choreographed some pretty dorky dance steps to this up-tempo number. Love the guitar. When Ziggy screws up a dance move and spins left when he should have gone right, Fran stops the song. She chastises him and tells him to take it from the top. Ziggy counts him in again, but before they can start, there's a loud bang on the garage door. Fran opens the automatic door, and they both squint in the bright daylight. As their eyes adjust, they see that there's a brown paper bag burning in their driveway. Ziggy rushes over and stomps out the flames. The cooked dog shit inside the bag splatters up his slacks and his platform shoes. He hears laughter from the other side of the road. On their neighbour's front porch is Paul and Garth Spader, his degenerate neighbours, massive heavy metal fans and haters of Christian funk. Paul and Garth are to be played by Luke and Owen Wilson. What 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 band t-shirts are they wearing? Because I kind of feel like they're going to really, be wearing... I'm really glad you asked that. They are the two biggest Motorhead fans in the country. Brilliant. Exactly Simon... what I pictured. Ziggy narrows his eyes looking at them. Fran joins him, her hands on her hips and a scowl on her face as the black, stinky smoke rises from the dog poo booby trap. Behind them, the auto garage door closes, revealing in ten-foot-tall spray-painted letters the word cuntface. Paul and Garth burst into laughter again. The next 30 minutes of the film is a series of escalating neighbour-on-neighbour revenge attacks. We see Paul and Garth walking to their Chevy ute on a hot summer's day. Ziggy and Fran are watching them from their front garden. The brothers get into the car and immediately start the stereo up. Loud, blaring metal thumps through the speakers. They wind down their windows, glaring across the street, looking as tough as possible. Paul flicks on the air conditioning, and the car instantly fills with brightly coloured confetti, spilling out of every air vent. Ziggy and Fran piss themselves laughing. We cut to Ziggy and Fran arriving home from work to find their golden retriever, Chewie, sitting in their front yard with all of his fur shaved off except for his head. He wags his tail, blissfully ignorant. Cut to 6am on a Sunday morning. The doorbell rings at Paul and Garth's place. 
Garth stumbles to answer it. Opening the door, he is greeted by a six-person church choir who launch into a high-pitched version of Joy to the World. He's almost knocked over by their volume and unbridled enthusiasm. He slams the door, but the choir only sing louder. Cut to Garth, crouched in the bushes outside Ziggy and Fran's office window. He's on his iPhone. He goes into the settings, opens his Wi-Fi connections, and connects to their unsecured wireless printer. With an evil grin, he opens the lyrics to Motorhead's Ace of Spades. He selects print and asks for 666 copies, and we watch as endless sheets of paper pour out of their machine, much to their confusion. We cut to a nighttime mission. It's Ziggy and Fran wearing night vision goggles as they creep across the road, pouring birdseed all over their neighbor's ute. When the brothers come out in the morning, the car is covered in a squawking flurry of birds in the middle of a feeding frenzy. They shoo the birds, only to reveal a bird shit splattered vehicle, which now resembles a Jackson Pollock painting. That's a great idea. It's not bad, is it? No, that's a good idea. I'm going to save that one. Cut to 5pm the next day. Fran pours herself a cup of tea and walks from the kitchen to the lounge to watch the prices right. Upon rounding the corner, she is struck by a blinding wall of light. The entire front room is lit up in an intensely bright glow. Squinting, she drops her tea and stumbles out the front door where she sees their latest devious scheme. Harnessing the power of the sun with a dozen large mirrors on their front porch, Paul and Garth have directed the blinding afternoon glare directly into her lounge room. This death ray is pure evil genius. With their guard dog, Wampa, patrolling the front yard, there is no way to get to the mirrors to redirect the blazing light. (laughs) The brothers have effectively rendered their lounge room uninhabitable during the afternoon. It's at this point that the media picks up on the neighbourly war. With local stations running amusing news pieces on the emerging street war, dubbing the weaponised mirrors the Chattanooga Death Ray. The effects are devastating on Fran. With the whole front of the house rendered useless for half of the day, cabin fever is creeping in and she's starting to lose her shit. That night, she hatches an ingenious plan. We cut to Ziggy and Fran on their front lawn. It's the middle of the night and they're wearing their night vision goggles once more and each is holding a controller. They nod at each other and simultaneously they both launch a drone helicopter, sending them buzzing over the road towards their sworn enemy. Wampa the guard dog snoozes peacefully as the drones quietly float overhead. Once the drones reach the porch, they carefully position them at the top edge of the two biggest mirrors. In a precision, synchronised manoeuvre, they tip the mirrors forward, causing a cataclysmic domino effect that topples and shatters every single mirror in an epic smash fest. The drones turn and head for home, but before they can make it, the front door to the Spader house bursts open. Paul and Garth are in their pyjamas, bed hair, wild-eyed and paranoid with shotguns raised. Garth fires first, taking down one of the drones, causing it to explode in mid-air. Paul charges forward, his gun raised, but barefoot, he steps on a jagged shard of glass, causing him to spin in pain and accidentally shoot Garth in the face. Whoa. Paul, yeah, I know. Whoa. Shit just escalated. Yeah. Paul drops to his knees, cradling his dead brother, sobbing into the night air. With Ziggy and Fran having run for cover, the remaining drone spirals in the night sky before dive bombing through a small window leading to the Spader brothers' basement. A strange greenish smoke starts pouring out of the shattered window. All the commotion has the street quickly fill with people and the police arrive. We watch a montage of the subsequent investigation. The green smoke leading police inside and it turns out the brothers were running a large meth lab in their basement. The biggest meth producers in the state. The final shot of the film is the next morning as a bundle of newspapers is dropped outside a local news agency. The headline reads, Daring nighttime raid by the rebellion kills Garth Spader and exposes meth star. Wow. Cut to black. I love what you've done with that. You like that? I do. Cheers, mate. Well, I've got a tagline for it. Yes, please, tell um, me. It's Star Wars related, unsurprisingly. Not surprised. Not so long ago, in a galaxy quite close by. Um, so cast-wise, we've got Ziggy Backer is played by Elijah Wood. Fran Backer, played by Kristen Schaal. Yes. Paul Spader is Luke Wilson. And Garth Spader is Owen Wilson. Nice. So I have to find an opportunity for him to say wow a few times. You do. I was a bit disappointed you didn't cast Rose Byrne in it. Yeah, she's good in everything. Yeah, she's great. Yeah. Actually, um, she Rose Byrne would be a great Fran. Yeah, actually. I think you need to. I think you need to rethink your casting. Well, I'll see if Kristen's available. If she's not, we've got a back up in Rose. Soundtrack wise, Ace of Spades by Motorhead is obviously a central key part of it. Um, plenty of Christian funk by uh, the Rebellion. Okay, and then I'd say the rest of the soundtrack would be done by John Williams. Budget wise, I'm, I'm thinking about ten million. I mean, is that pretty, all? It's pretty much an indie film. I mean, there's no real yeah. effects to it. A couple of drones involved. Look, I'm a bit concerned. Mine's a bit shit. I wouldn't be. We'll see if the people at Pixar pick it up. 
Yeah, I think there'll be a lot of interest, actually. I think it's the, it's the one place that they haven't really gone is bestiality. You know, they, they have a lot of animal-human relationships, but they, they're yet to look, cross that not, fine line. Look, I'm a bit concerned that you call it a bestiality film because it's not really a bestiality film. It's, it's just, kind of the crux of the film, mate. It's, it's a guy not. fucking a chicken, let's be honest. No, they don't fuck. You made it quite clear that the implications are they're There's boning impl- by night. They're close. Yeah, well. Very close. For those of you at home, there's a devilish twinkle in Pete's eye. So, yeah, he's talking about chicken Do you fucking. fuck all your friends? I do not. If you like to go, And that is all we have time for on this week's show. So you have two films to think about. You've got Peter's film. Tiny and Clark's Excellent Adventure. And my film, The Rebellion of Funk. Jump onto the Facebook page. You'll find a poll pinned to the top of the page. Vote for the one that you think is the least shithouse. At the end of the week, we'll pick a winner and a poster will be made for said film. Pete, thanks so much for coming in, man. It's been awesome. Thank you for having me. I realise this is probably my first and only appearance on the show, so thank you. Almost 100%. <laughs> no, it's been really cool, man. Thank you. That was rad. Bye. See you, cunts. I have come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass. I jumped over three linebackers in midair. I sprouted animals like a gazelle. <laughs> no one laughs at a master of quack fool. Real nice. Many have died from starvation due to the difficulty of finding enough food such as seals. Shut up. No more Mr. Nice Duck. That's it. Right, Mr. Six? What do you make of that? You know, it's the most fantastic story I've ever heard. The Round Carpet Podcast. Ah, fuck this. I can see where you're going with this. In a residential conflict that defies all sense and belief, Kate and Stephen have also erected a timber force field to repel the sunlight and floodlights from their porch. Fuck it! In a residential (laughs) conflict... One more shot at that. When you're done. Sorry, is this take 332? Roughly. Roughly? Yeah. Okay. Don't worry, I'll get worse. In a residential conflict, the defly... Oh, fuck me. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, I think a pube named Sharpie is appropriate. Yeah, pube named Sharpie. That's actually a good name for a band, pube named Sharpie. A pube named Sharpie. <laughs>